Let me tell you a short story in five parts. One. I only heard people talking about Live Alive for the first time within the past few years. I thought it didn't sound that interesting. Two, I watched one of my favorite streamers, Film Cow, play a bit of it, and it still didn't really do much for me. But then three, everyone was really excited for the recent remaster. And then four, the trailers made it look really good. And then finally five, the reviewers I follow on YouTube, like Zygor Gaming, gave it lots of praise. I figured I'd give it a try. It was absolutely worth it. Hey everybody, I'm Michael. Thanks for watching my quick review of Live Alive. Live Alive is a 1994 RPG by Square that was originally released only for the Super Famicom in Japan. Though a fan translation existed, subsequent official ports of the game for the Nintendo Virtual Console on Wii U and 3DS did not come with an official translation. This game was not officially localized to other languages until the Nintendo Switch Remake in 2022. This is the version that I played. Live Alive was the directorial debut of Takashi Tokida, who later went on to direct Chrono Trigger and Parasite Eve, along with working on many other games before and after this. Since this game is still fairly new to a large chunk of people who have not played it due to the recent release I mentioned earlier, I'll avoid spoilers here. In order to avoid spoilers, I won't talk about the characters much in this review. I will spend some time with the story, though. Live Alive starts as a series of seven unrelated stories, each with different casts of characters, set in different locations and in different time periods. When you finish those seven, a little bit more opens up. These stories aren't of equal quality. Each story has a gameplay gimmick, which I'll be discussing as part of this, running through the stories in chronological order. Prehistory is a pretty weak chapter overall. This chapter has zero dialogue, everyone just grunts. To me, the lack of dialogue gets old quickly. The basic plot is a little tired and the characters aren't super interesting, but the gameplay in this one is pretty fun. Pogo, the main character, has a sniff command. He can use it to solve puzzles and even find battles on the map, sort of doing away with random encounters. Imperial China is a pretty dark story. It's also a story we've seen before pretty much, but there's a twist in it that I didn't see coming. The gameplay quirk in this chapter ties into that twist, so I can't really talk about it. What really holds this chapter back is that it's so battle heavy. It gets pretty tiresome after a while. The Twilight of Edo Japan is a fantastic chapter. There are different endings to this chapter, depending on if you kill everybody, or if you kill nobody. The chapter plays like a stealth infiltration game if you want to avoid battles. The Wild West, though, is almost all story and basically no gameplay. The story is fine, but with not much else to mix it up, this chapter ends up being pretty dull. The gameplay quirk here is that a good chunk of the chapter is timed, but you should have plenty of time to do everything. I thought the Imperial China chapter had too much fighting, but the present day chapter ends up being just a boss gauntlet. I like the look of this chapter a lot, especially with the fighting game-esque character selection screen, but other than that, it's pretty boring. The quirk here is that your character learns moves from other characters that you're fighting immediately after they use them on him. So for a lot of each fight, you're just waiting around for them to use their move so you can learn it. The near future is a fun one, and a long one. The story here is wild, and there are a few too many characters, but overall it's really good. The gameplay quirk here is that the main character can read people's minds, which is pretty fun. The distant future has fewer battles than the Wild West chapter, only a boss fight at the very end. This chapter plays like a space horror film. I wasn't expecting to like it, but I ended up really loving it. The voice actors in this chapter in particular do some really excellent work. The chapter is full of tension and dread, and it's overall really emotionally effective. I love all of the characters in this chapter. 
like I said, I'm not going into detail with any of the characters. But overall, even with a few standout favorites, they're just fine. The graphics, though, are excellent. I am such a sucker for the HD 2D style. All of the cutscenes are rendered in-engine, so nothing looks out of place. Just all around a beautiful looking game. As for design, the sprites are all beautiful, but a few of the character sprites are a little tired as ideas go. The towns, dungeons, and monsters are all excellent, though. Some of the monsters in the final chapter are legit disturbing. Sound is a bit of a sore spot. The music is excellent. It's by the great Yoko Shimomura. If you've seen a vid where I talk about her before, you know I'm a huge fan. The sound effects are also good. But then we have the voice acting. I think each of the actors does a fantastic job, but their line delivery is so slow and the space between lines takes too long. I think the fault for this lies with the voice director and the editors, and it makes me wish fewer of the lines were voice acted. I gave the gameplay for Live Alive a 5 out of 5. Not all of the gameplay gimmicks that I mentioned earlier are good in each chapter, and the battles can get a little tedious at points, but the learning curve and the difficulty are just about perfect. If I'm saying the difficulty is perfect, repeat viewers know that means the game is pretty easy. A little bit more about the battle system. This is a turn-based game, and each battle is fought on a grid. When it's your character's turn, you see the gauge filling for every other character with each action you take, and you can see what the range of your various attacks will be. It becomes increasingly important to hit your enemy's weaknesses when possible, and to stay at the right range where you can deal the most damage and take the least. You can also see when an enemy is charging a more powerful attack, and one of your attacks might be able to cancel that charge. Some of your attacks can also push an enemy back, and many of the skills that your party and the enemies use might put a poison or a fire effect on a tile, which will slowly damage whoever is on that tile. It's a pretty fun system. My final score, based on all the scores above, is an 87%, which just so happens to be the score that I thought the game deserved. So, averaging both of those scores together, it's an 87%, or a B. Here's where Live Alive fits in our game ranking. I know there's a bit of controversy in one of those scores up there. We may have to revisit some scores at some point. If you haven't played Live Alive yet, I don't think this is quite a rush to get it right now kind of game. I'd say if you like retro RPGs and want to try something a little off the beaten path, add this to your wish list and get to it eventually. I really did enjoy most of the game. If I didn't enjoy a part, I just had to push through to the next chapter, which was usually better. I hope you eventually do get this one though, and I hope you like it. Thanks so much for watching my review. Please let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Give this video a like if you liked it, or give it a pity like if you hated it. Subscribe to our channel to hear more rambling about media, mostly games and music. Down here, you can check out another video that YouTube thinks you might like. Side note, you like the new end card? I'm slowly getting better at editing. Anyway, see y'all next time. Maintain your groovy selves.